to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. Roll call, please. President Van Portfley? Here. President Pro Tem Narsh? Here. Councilmember Hobbs? Here. Councilmember Lamb? Here. Councilmember Luxinger requested to be excused. Councilmember Matheson? Here. Councilmember Rudd? Here. President Van Portfley, we have a quorum. Thank you. Item four on the agenda this evening is presentations. We have the annual audit presentation. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Greg Soll. I'm the audit partner uh, with Andrew Super Pavlik in charge of the village's audit. Um, here to present the, the financial statements and the results of the audit. So at this point, we have completed the village's audit. Uh, very good results. Uh, Josh, Carl, Joe, and the rest of the village team did a very good job answering questions and that sort of thing. We had no uh, proposed audit adjustments, no internal control or material weaknesses that we identified. So very good results, very good results for the, for the village this year. I'll just roll through the financial statements and quickly point out some highlights to Council. The first section of the report is the report of independent auditors that is a clean or an unmodified opinion. Um, that means based on our procedures, these numbers represent the underlying activity for the village. Got some notes here. Next thing I'll point your attention to is on page 12. And that gets into the, the fund level statements. So the, the, the financial statements for the village are separated out into government-wide statements that present the financial position for the village as a whole, so for a longer term view, and then the fund level financial statements that I know council and village management monitors very closely. So on page 12 starts the fund level financial statements, and this shows some of the larger funds for the village, the general fund, the public works fund, the police fund, and then some of those smaller funds are grouped together in the column other governmental funds. You can see towards the bottom of the first column here the unrestricted fund balance for the general fund is a little over 759,000. That represents about 38 percent of annualized expenditures and transfers out for the general fund. That's a pretty good position for that fund to be in. There's certainly lots of discussion about what that number should be for the general fund, but 38 percent is, is a pretty good position for that fund. The next thing I'll point Council's attention to is on page 14 of the financial statements. This is the revenue and expense statement for the governmental funds. So you can see at the, the, first, uh, the first row here, property taxes of a little over 1.5 million, that includes 1.1 million in the general fund and a little over 300,000 on the police fund. Total expenditures for the governmental funds were just over 2.7 million. And you can see the net increase in fund balance for the governmental funds was 339,000. For the general fund, that increase in fund balance was a little over 55,000. So again, good financial results for the governmental funds for, for this uh, fiscal year ended June 30th. Next thing I'll point your attention to, Council, is the water and sewer fund. So you can see on page 16 here, uh, total cash and investments of 1.9 million for the water and sewer fund, and accounts receivable and due from state of a little over 800,000 combined there. Total revenues for the water and sewer fund were just over 1.9 million. Again, this is on page 17. Total operating expenses for the water and sewer fund of a little over 1.7 million which resulted after operating uh, revenues and expenses, primarily interest, a net loss in the water and sewer fund of just over 13,000. So as you continue to have the water and sewer bond debt, you're gonna continue to have interest expense there and that's gonna drive that operating revenue down. Next section of the financial statements is the fiduciary funds. So we've got the Retiree Health Care Trust Fund. Call your attention to on page 20, uh, you can see an increase in fair value of the investments in that OPEB trust fund of 40, little over 41,000. Again, that reflects some favorable investment activity in the financial markets. Next section of the financial statements is the notes. 
and dropping down to page 30 within the notes that gets into the investments footnote. And that gives a breakdown of the types of investments that the village has and separated out into the governmental funds and the water and sewer fund. So you can see the governmental activities towards the bottom of page 30 uh, has cash and investments of just under 2.1 million and the water and sewer fund of just over 1.9 million. So the rest of that footnote gets into some more detail about the types of investments. Certainly the largest investment you have is the local government investment pool with the county, as well as the Michigan class pooled investments. And then on the OPEB trust fund, the breakout between bonds and equity on those mutual funds. Dropping down to page 36, you can see some of the inner fund activity transfers in and transfers out between the funds of the village. And the bottom of that page, there's a paragraph about the uh, advance from the Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund to the Public Works Fund that was done last year to purchase a vehicle and how that's been paid down this year. It's over a period of years that that will be paid off. Next thing I'll call Council's attention to is the pension footnote. And that begins on page 42 of the financial statements. If you drop down to page 44, there's a table there that gives a roll forward of the uh, pension plan position. So you can see the total pension liability, the plan assets are the middle column, and then the net pension liability. So there was a slight increase in the pension liability this year, and this is the pension that's held at MERS, uh, the defined benefit pension. That increase was primarily driven by a change in actuarial assumptions. 178,000. Your total increase on the pension was just under 100,000 and the liability there. Next major footnote is on the OPEB plan. Again, similar type of table. If you drop down to page 51, you can see that same type of table for the OPEB plan. And you can see your OPEB plan had a little bit of a decrease in the net OPEB liability from 1.8 last year to 1.7 million this year. So again, about a $100,000 decrease on the OPEB liability. That's for the retiree health care plan. Again, primarily driven by favorable investment results and a favorable change in, in actuarial assumptions. And the last thing I'll call Council's attention to within the financial statements is the budgetary activity. Um, if you drop down to page 56, this is a table at the top there that we always include within the financial statements to show the uh, case where expenditures exceed the amount appropriated. Um, and there's only one line item this year for planning and zoning of a $4,500 variance on a $49,000 budgetary line item. So it, what that tells you, because if you look at all of the different budgets that you have to track for all the different funds, to only have one unfavorable variance at the expenditure level, that's a pretty good result. So that, that shows that management tracks the, the expenditures, that they come to council appropriately when there needs to be an amendment to that budget and that they monitor and control those expenditures. So that's a good thing. So that concludes the financial statements. The majority or the remainder of the document includes additional detail and breakout on the budget, on the pension, on the OPEB, and on some of those smaller governmental funds. The other document that we issue as part of the audit is our required communications letter to council. That contains uh, the required communications that we as the village's auditor must make. It also includes some uh, informational items, uh, things that will bring to council and management's attention about upcoming accounting standards, upcoming changes from the state perspective, and that sort of thing. All of the required communications are in the affirmative. We had no significant difficulties encountered in performing the audit. There were no major changes and the timing and the plan scope that we had when we initially met with management. Um, we had no journal entries, we had no material weaknesses, and so overall it was a very smooth audit. So with that, I'll take any questions or anything like that from council. Mr. Narsh. Yeah. Uh, just a question on the retirement system sure. uh, pension liability. What percent are we funded at? So at the... that up the supplementary side. I'm not really good at math, so <laughs> I, I don't want to try that in my head. 
66.6%, Carl says. So there is a footnote or a uh, table in the supplementary information. Uh, what's an average uh, community in Michigan funding? Do we know? That's a pretty good percent to be pretty at. Pretty yeah. good percentage. I think under PA202, you're considered funded, right? Yes. So that's a good... That's a, Over 60. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if you were unfunded, you'd have to go through some more processes to right. get that corrected. Yeah. And the same thing with the OPEB. You're considered funded there as well. So I asked our treasurer earlier today um, if he knew if there was formulas that are published, such as how much should we have available of fund balance. We talk about this quite often, whether it's supposed to be 18%, 26%, 33%, and there's a few others, much like the retirement funding. And what's, is there information out there that's kind of like a, a, a review scenario of the five top items and where we should be positioned on each of them to be healthy? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great, a great question. So, from a from a benchmark perspective, the Government Finance Officers Association recommends no lower than two months of annualized expenditures, which works out to be somewhere in the 15 to 18 percent range. No lower than that. But the problem with giving a point estimate like that is you have to take into account the nature and timing of the village's cash flows and what particular snapshot of fund balance you're using. So if you're looking at it at June 30th, you have to look at when some of those property tax collections are going to come in, when maybe charges for services for some of the other different funds are going to come in, and how those cash flows time out, as well as what level of risk are you comfortable with as a council and as management to you know, if you want to get a little aggressive and run that fund balance a little lower, that could potentially expose the village to increased risk. So what risk tolerance do you have in that regard? Um, there's, there's lots of things to, to, to consider in that, but there's a couple of different pieces of information that the Government Finance Officers Association has to take a look at, you know, making those determinations, and here's some risk factors to consider and that sort of thing. So. Sure. If you might be able to forward those, or I would be interested in reading them. Yep. And yep. Part of the reason why I ask that question is on page 8, there is a statement of unrestricted net position of the water and sewer fund at the end of the year amounted to 2,491,000 XYZ. And a total net loss of 86,216 in the prior fiscal year. On page seven, it states the same. In fiscal year 2020, the water and sewer fund reflected a decrease in that position of 86,000. How important is that to me? That's a good question because it's, it's much like what you just talked about, the ebb and flows. When I talked to the village manager today, he said, well, we've had it decrease because of COVID and and uh, the restaurants aren't using as much water and so on and so forth. Because my question is, should we be looking at increasing our rates? It's very important that when I see a net loss like that, I want to try to investigate it. I want to have my head in the game and be on it. And so we talked today, uh, Joe and I did, Mr. Young, about creating a five-year forecast going forward. Right. Much like we've seen a lot of great success on the county level in what we expect. Because Mr. Young had said typically it's uh, about a 3% variance, sir. Was that what we were, we were talking Pardon? 3%. Yeah. And in this case here, it represents, I think, like a 16 or 18% swing. For the township, right? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, I'm sorry. And there is also the township uh, water fee and so on and so forth, which was 14% last year. It's 3% this year. So where are we going? How well can we protect our community going forward? But Joe is going to put together a five-year plan plus what we've seen in the past for our information so we could help lead better. Right. But I'd appreciate the information you might send me as well. Okay. Sure. The key with putting together a five-year plan is clearly laying out the assumptions. Right. So that you know Absolutely. what, you know, when, when it plays out over time, how do those assumptions and those actuals align with your assumptions at right, right now? Yeah. Well, can, can I ask a question along that line? And uh, those assumptions didn't include COVID, right? And I know that every community right. suffered with commercial water loss. So this loss this year, what is that uh, in reflection to, say, the last three years? And that would be for uh, Mr. Young. Yes, it would. Be. I mean, we're fortunate that we came within 13,000 breaking even. And that's yeah. good. 
because <laughs> that includes depreciation. Uh, last year we were at 86. Uh, the two years before we did have a positive, but you know we're heading the right way. And yes, we and this remember we adopted rates five years ago to increase to address this bond issue. So this is the last year. So now we're evaluating, hopefully on some stable volume numbers and cost. So they can they do a, a respectable projection to knowing if and how much we need to raise rates or finer the revenues. And uh, the last question I'd have is, uh, did we receive, uh, it's my understanding that one of the pillars of the federal funding uh, from COVID that went back to communities was for water sewer. Yes. Is that, does this reflect that funding that we received under those Not grants? This year, we received it, this <coughs> current budget year. That, I did put out the 166,000 we got this year okay. into water sewer, but this is not covering that year. Okay. And we could look at changing that if we wanted to, but I just temporarily put it there because we have some options we're going to present to you. We have four years to spend the money. We well, there's our five-year plan. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, any other questions? I, I, Mr. Lamb. Hi, I'm Mike Lamb. I, we haven't met, but it's a pleasure to meet you. I have a couple of questions. What was the total revenue for the village? Total revenue for the village? So total revenues for the village were uh, 4.9 million. That's on page seven. And that includes both the uh, governmental activities, the general fund, as well as the water sewer fund. But, so that's that's all the money that right. comes into the village through taxes, kickbacks from the federal and state government, right. and through fees from the sewer and water charges that we get in our bills that we get. But that doesn't include the DDA. Does not include the DDA. The DDA. Is I guess my next question, Joe. Boy, you have mind reading. So on page 67, the uh, total revenues of the DDA would be, I think that's on, I'm sorry, page 68. Yeah. The total revenues for the DDA would be 879,000. So 800, so the DDA brings in by itself $879,000 a year. Uh, mostly from property taxes, correct? Yep. $700,000 in property taxes go to the DDA. Correct. And then I was looking at the expenditures of the DDA. Um, what I garner here, it's, it's classified as community development $500,000. And because I'm not an accountant and I don't know accounting practices, um, I feel that this is a mischaracterization of the expenditures of the DDA because I know personally that you know, fifty thousand dollars is for brand marketing like Nike. A um, hundred and uh, I think forty thousand dollars is spent on salaries for the director and staff, and then there's another forty or fifty thousand dollars spent on leases, and then the rest of it is spent on promotional parties. Um, I call them. That's my characterization. So the you know the community development. I don't see any community development expenses at all, except for the. I believe this $500,000 parking lot uh, that they built, a gra gravel parking lot, um, and they're making $100,000 payments. They borrowed the money from the village, and they're making $100,000 a year payments to the village yep. from their fund? Yep. Okay, so that's, that's another huge part of our economy here. Yep. I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. I get so rarely that we get an audience to give these numbers to how how much money the DDA actually brings in and spends from our tax dollar. And uh, last but not least, so the current assets and total uh, cash assets of the DDA at this time are? Uh, 787000 All right, they have $780,000 in the bank, and how much do they owe currently? 500. They owe to the 500000 to the um, water sewer fund. Yeah. For the parking lot, okay. So they have a cash balance of a couple hundred thousand, then two fifty something like that. Well, net, net, net. net yeah, yeah I, I don't. A lot of the, I just got to look at the how much money we have, how much we owe. That's how I look at money. All right. Well, thank you. I just want to verify those figures, make sure I've got the right ones. Yeah.
<clears throat> well, the other thing, anyway, if I might, on page 10, uh, it shows the total go primary government and the DDA. And the DDA does have almost $4 million of assets, part of which is your capital and parking lots and things as well. So sure, I don't. 700000 is their fund yeah. balance, but they have uh, fixed assets of a net of $2 million. Seven. Yeah, the assets are things like water and sewer things that they bought for the Parking village, lights, right? Street so, lights. Buildings. Yeah, they're not really marketable items. They're no, like street no. lights. Over the last 30 years, they bought some street lights and stuff, and that's that's great. Thank you. Okay. Any other okay. Questions? Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you for the great report. Mm. Item five. Call to the public. Um, I've got a list of some people that might want to speak on non-agenda items. We'd like to ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. And we'll start with who, uh, should, I, I call, should I call out on this list here? Um, I'll start with uh, Ms. Bonnie Blaze. Uh, do you, should Lori just come up with me? Uh, Ms. Lori Bryant. Thank Hi. Good evening. Good evening, Village Council. I am um, Bonnie Blaze, and I have been a resident and business owner in the Village of Lake Orion for almost 20 years. And I love this town. I love it a lot. Um, it's a great place to live. Um, it was a great, great place to own a business, and I currently have a business, a uh, graphic design business. Um, this is Lori Bryan, who also was a uh, business owner in Lake Orion for many years and a resident in Oxford. And um, did you want to say anything? Well, I lived in Lake Orion for 15 years. Oh, yeah. I she did. was on Conklin Road. Yes. Yep. In the yeah. But yes. Yeah. Um, I, so I opened my first business in Lake Orion with this beautiful woman right there, crazy lady, Shelly Peak. And um, we came in with a vision, and um, it was to put our beautiful, um, you know, to take a beautiful space and make it something wonderful for the community, which we took a building and we renovated it. In that process, what we learned is that Lake Orion, and I've seen a ton of progress since I had my first business here, which I'm sure Lori can attest to, and all that progress has been wonderful. So we have all these great restaurants now, we have great retail, we have people coming in. When Shelly and I had our store, we used to have women that would come in for a full day and they would eat at restaurants and local businesses and shop at other local businesses. Um, one thing they were missing is for girls weekends or for weekends, they had no place to stay. Our community does not offer um, in the village anywhere that people can come and stay when they're visiting family. Um, and it was, you know, we've had these Airbnbs, which are a huge thing now, these um, short-term rentals. And we're here tonight to actually address that. And what we're asking for, um, right now there is a bill in the Senate, and it's Bill 4722. And I know it's not voted in yet, because I see all the smiles. <laughs> and I've been told two things. I've been told it's not voted in yet, it's not voted in yet, you know. And I've also been told, don't come to the village because, you know what, by then it might be voted in. And that was by um, people who responded to some calls. So the thing about it is, what do I do? Because me and Lori have property on the lake that we have bought, beautiful property that nobody wanted. Um, Mr. Syrowski, who's here today, I showed the property with him. Um, these houses, um, if somebody were to purchase them, the people that he was showing, would have knocked them down and built a big house on the top of the hill, which I have one next to me. Um, and I saw potential in these houses. I saw potential to have them for me. Lori was looking for a place on the lake also. And um, the second house on the property was too much for me. So in the meantime, I started fixing up these houses. 
and I started getting requests from people who live on the lake who needed a place for their family to stay when they were coming to visit. Because we're in the boat club and a lot of people were like, my friend Kat May, there is a current Airbnb across from her owned by Nicole Curtis and she benefits from it. She couldn't be here tonight, but she said, you know, when we have family coming in, this is where they can stay. There's no other place for them to stay. It's a safe place. The people at Airbnb check who the guests are, they check who the hosts are, they monitor it. Um, I brought in a bunch of stuff to hand out today to you guys. They're the reviews from the people who have stayed at my place. Mothers, daughters, um, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we had mother, one, I had one mother come to visit who brought her daughter for a robotics tournament and we had a neighbor call the cops with no complaint other than it was an Airbnb and that woman felt uncomfortable and left. So I am a property owner. Um, I have property owner rights um, and I'm trying to do something beneficial for the community while I'm fixing this place up. I cannot possibly pay for this place, fix it up, and I'm offering an experience for people to come and see what Lake Orion is all about. Benefit Lori? the whole village. Actually. Yeah, benefit the village. Yes. So. These houses were shacks. Yeah. They were, if you see, the, the neighbor that, we have a, a discussion with the neighbor and um, all the docks that we have at our property right now are underwater except the one I pulled up and we plan on pulling them all up. Um, the houses were really, the people living in them were not upkeeping them. No. They should have been condemned. Um, she's putting $35,000 into one. I've already done major upgrades to mine, including using local businesses to landscape, yes. to do contracting, everything, lawn maintenance. I feel very passionate about this. And I feel passionate about it because I love this community and this is a benefit. You can't say this is a vacation town where living is a vacation and not offer people a place to vacation. Doesn't make sense. So that's all I got. Lori? That was about three minutes, wasn't it? <laughs> was that, oh, you know what? Can I read one more letter? And I know you probably all saw it. But it was a really nice letter that my friend Tina wrote for me today. Tina owns Nuts About Chocolate in downtown Lake Orion. And I love her chocolate and I've used it myself for you know parties and such. So I offer when my guests come into my Airbnb, I spend $20 and buy something at local businesses and I leave it on the counter for my guests so that they can see what Lake Orion has to offer. I leave menus, I leave coupons, they go into other businesses when they go downtown. So this is what she wrote. She said, hello village council members. I am the owner of Nuts About Chocolate in downtown Lake Orion. I am writing to you in support of Bonnie Blaze and her Airbnb rental. Having recently experienced a vacation stay at an Airbnb, I would highly recommend Lake Orion embrace this vacation concept. My family and I enjoyed the benefits of having a homey place to stay together, and because of the reasonable rates, we found we had more time to explore and spend money locally. Lake Warren has plenty to offer these vacationers. Our Airbnb was located within a neighborhood intermixed with full-time residential homes. We stayed 10 days and found the experience as a whole pleasant and less stressful than a hotel. Bonnie's Airbnb is beautifully maintained and tastefully presented. Plus, Bonnie provides every client a welcome gift that includes products from the local businesses. She has graciously selected nuts for her welcome gifts on several occasions, which in turn has brought business to us from visitors to the area. And if they are visiting one shop in town, it is likely they are visiting other businesses as well. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you can see the potential benefits. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I, can, I have these for you guys to pass out after, but I'll let, if that's good. Thank Are you, you done? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Mr. Carl Sarowski. Good evening. Good evening. Carl Sarowski, I live at 223 O'Connor. Uh, I am a licensed real estate broker in the state of Michigan. I have lived in Lake Orion since 1986 and have been an, a licensed broker since 1987. That's 35 plus years. 
I have brokered many sales and leases of commercial properties over that period of time in the village. I have been and still am involved in volunteering for many village activities such as the upcoming lighted Christmas parade and the 4th of July fireworks show, to mention a few. Recently I had the houses located at 518 and 520 Bellevue listed for sale without, without much interest because they were in such bad shape. Uh, Bonnie Blaze and her partner made an offer close to the asking price and purchased both of these properties. It's, it's a strange deal, 518 and 520 have separate addresses, but sometime in the past they were combined under one tax ID number, and they can't be split apart. They have to be sold as one or owned by one. Um, Anyway, after she and her partner purchased the properties for close to the asking price, uh, they, they proceeded to renovate <coughs> the first one at 518 Bellevue, and at considerable cost, by the way. I mean, this house was really in bad shape. And it now is livable and much more livable, and as a uh, rental, short-term rental, she's got nothing but accolades from neighbors, and barring a few, but uh, that she has improved the neighborhood, and, and that stands without reason. She is currently, her and her partner are renovating the one at 520, which should come online in the next month or two. Uh, the neighborhood residents in general have been very appreciative of what the, the new ambiance and value of the, to the whole neighborhood. I recently, going to another topic, I recently sold a building at 18 South Broadway to Mark and Monica Vizna, which is occupied there by their law firm, my office, and State Farm Insurance. Mark and Monica planned on attending this meeting and wanted to speak, but they had a family emergency. Instead, they gave me a letter, which I can give you a copy of, which they wanted me to read into the minutes. So here's their letter dated today, December 13th, or dated yesterday, whatever. It's, it says, regarding short-term rentals, Airbnb, VR, BO, et cetera. It says, Dear Village Council Members, we are Lake Orion residents of 26 years. My husband and I own a business in a building in downtown Lake Orion, Ohio, and home in Indian Shores, and otherwise partake fully in all this wonderful town has to offer. We eat locally, shop locally, raise funds personally, and through our Rotary Club that are spent locally, kayak and boat locally, and so much more locally. In sum, we love this town and share in this council's interest of doing the right thing for our town. We do not own a short-term rental, and from here on out, she's gonna to refer to them as STRs. So we do not own a short-term STR in Lake Orion. However, we do own five STRs in multiple locations outside of Lake Orion. As such, our perspective on this topic comes from both being long-term residents of Lake Orion and persons with experience owning and managing STRs. We will start by saying that there is a lot of misinformation about STRs. The main piece of misinformation is that STRs are undesirable because they somehow lower property values. That is false. Study after study find the exact opposite. STRs actually raise property values, not lower them. In fact, one specific study by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which is the NLIHC, deals with the specific concern from the opposite perspective. Namely, the effect that STRs have on raising property values is of a concern to the NLIHC because it makes more difficult for low-income renters and first-time buyers to afford houses in areas where STRs have prol proliferated. 
This study as well as many other studies finds that for every additional Airbnb listing within 200 feet of a property, the market value of that property increased by 0.78%. Indeed, that study found that the increase in single-family home prices in areas that allow STRs rose from 0.66% average to 2.24% growth on account of the STRs alone. These conclusions are consistent with our experience as STR owners. To give you an example, we have an STR in Destin, Florida, which we bought in, 19, or in 2013 for 499000 Today, that STR is worth 800000 Further, the neighborhood is magnificent, not despite STRs, but because of them, since STR owners tend to compete for the prettiest and most inviting STR. In our opinion, therefore, whether Lake Orion embraces and regulates STRs is an issue of goals and vision. If the interest of the village council is to hold Lake Orion back from having a higher profile outside of Lake Orion, as well as to prevent the economic development that flows from STRs for the pur purpose of keeping property values down, to protect low-income renters and first-time buyers in Lake Orion, then we would agree that STRs are not consistent with that goal and vision. However, if the interest of the Village Council is to increase property values and to promote and foster economic development in our community, then STRs should be welcome as they are catalysts for such development and prosperity. And of course, once STRs are welcomed into Lake Orion, they should be regulated, just as any other land use is regulated. We should require STRs to be registered, to pay a fee, and to otherwise comply with all local ordinances, such as noise, no parking in the street, etc. This is not difficult to do, and in and of itself can be a huge source of revenue for our local government. As part of the decision making on this topic, and apart from the fact that STRs raise property values, a con if you are a low income renter and a pro if you are a homeowner, the village council must entertain the other pros and cons of short term rentals. The cons to STRs are known. Noise, yes, people who are vacationing tend to be louder. However, the lake is not particularly quiet. Further, noise can be regulated through noise ordinances. Activity. Yes, there will be more activity as it is prerequisite for any economic activity, but activity is not a negative and easily can be regulated through appropriate rules on the STR owners as well as public ordinances. In contrast, there are many pros for STRs. STRs raise the profile of Lake Orion and promise it as a desirable destination to work, live, vacation, dine, consume goods, etc. This, in our view, is progress. STRs cause extensive economic activity. People in short-term rentals come into town to partake in all that the town has to offer. They shop, they dine, they purchase things, etc. This is great for the local businesses in the area who are the economic fuel for our, our community. STRs, if allowed, would reinvigorate a legacy that is almost lost in the community. Lake Orion's motto is where living is a vacation. That is our history. We are proud of it. Why wouldn't we want to make it possible for people who are not residents of Lake Orion to partake in our amazing town and then go spread the news about it to others? This makes Lake Orion desirable and is good for Lake Orion residents, homeowners, and business owners. The foregoing increases the tax base from which improvements can be funded by our local government. In some, in our view, banning STRs from Lake Orion takes the town backward, not forward. 
Therefore, we, respect, we respectfully request that the Village Council carefully study how to appropriately regulate short-term rentals and pass appropriate ordinance, ordinances to that effect rather than ban STRs outright. For all of this, the reasons set, for all the reasons set forth in this letter, we request that SDRs be allowed in Lake Orion. Thank you for your consideration, Mark Vizna and Monica Navarro Vizna. They live at 35 Cayuga Road, Lake Orion, and members of the Navarro Vizna Holdings, which is 18 South Broadway, and as members of the Vizna Law Group at the same address. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sherry D'Annunzio. Um, so I'm just here, I'm Sherry D'Annunzio. Um, I've been in Lake Orion, I think for about 14, 15 years with my family. Um, Bonnie is a very good friend of mine and I'm here to support her. Um, I think what she's doing is a great thing for the community and just I'm here for to, to support her. Thank you. So, thanks. I don't have any other names on the sign-in sheet, but we'll invite other people that would like to speak to step up. Hello, Mr. Enright, sir. Hello, Mr. Van Portley. Mr. and Mrs. Enright. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is John Enright, my wife Debbie Enright. We've lived in uh, the village and in the township for better than 20 some years. Would you give us your address? Uh, 511 Bellevue, right hey. across the street from the property uh, we've been talking about. Okay. Um, I'll try and keep to the suggested three minute guideline. I appreciate that. First, um, the, uh, the fact is that this is against the village ordinances. Um, I don't know if it's a law or not, but it's against the, the village ordinances, and it's still. Is that accurate, been, Mr. Young? Yes, I am. The ordinance right here. Um, it's uh, it's been going through the the legislature for the better part of the year, um, and is kind of stalled. But in the meantime, it's still against the ordinances. Um, recently, I've had a conversation with uh, Ms. Blaze. Uh, she brought in some cameras. Uh, she had concerns with the overdoses, drug overdoses in the neighborhood, and she was going to install cameras. Um, I had talked with one of her renters uh, the day before, or the weekend before, um, and he seemed uh, a little agitated in his driveway. We, uh, we had a conversation uh, in regards to the uh, the rates, and uh, I think at that point there was a, uh, uh, during that weekend there was a, uh, an officer brought out to the site. Um, he was cited again. Um, the, the property is uh, much better than it used to be. Uh, it's, uh, it's still a rental, though, and the, uh, uh, it's neglected through the week. There are people there on the weekends, and nobody... Nobody comes out uh, during the week. Um, the neighbors in general are not supportive. Uh, everyone that I've talked to has been uh, very hesitant. There are two little girls, um, four and seven years old, that live right next door to the property where people that come in during the week or, or during the weekend are uh, renting and they park there. Um, they. Uh, Nobody knows anybody. There, nobody's vetted through Airbnb, Airbnb or VRBO, and uh, you can have anybody as long as you've got 250 bucks in your pocket. You can come and hang out across the street from my house. Um, Mark and Monica, that uh, Vizina that uh, Mr. Sorowski referred to, do own an STR, and it's in Colombia. It's in Cartagena, Colombia. It's not anywhere near here. Um, we pay taxes to have neighbors that we know and that we trust and we know on a daily basis and we don't get that. Um, if it's a law or if it's passed that uh, someday it's allowable, then I can I get it. It's a, it's a free country and you do what you want with the property that you got as long as nobody's getting hurt and nobody's being bothered. But in the meantime, we have a real concern. It's just that you know your neighbor. 
you know that person that's going to pull up in the driveway. With these Airbnbs, you don't know who's coming in there. And I know with long-term rentals, people have to be vetted. You're, you're paying 100 bucks, $150 to be vetted, and you have to stay there three to six months. With these weekend rentals, um, you don't know who's there or who they're bringing there. At least you know your neighbors. And I get live and let live. More power to you. If you can make something work, great. But in the meantime, there's, there should be rules. If it's going to be allowed, there should be rules. And I'm all about that. Um, I got a call or a text from Bonnie accusing me of calling. I never called. I was hesitant. My husband did call, but I'm not going to, that's his choice. That wasn't mine. And the more I thought about it, after her phone call or text to me accusing me that I did something where I, I didn't do a thing, and I, I'm supporting it. I'm supporting my husband. I thought about it. It's right. You don't know who's coming there that's pulling up in that driveway. And the neighbors that have two little girls, you don't know if pedophiles are, or if they're doing drugs. You just don't know. That's my point on it. But if it is allowed, there should be rules. And I, I mean, I don't blame her for trying to make a living, but you got to think, we pay high taxes to live on the lake. And we'd like to keep it safe. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you. I thank you for your comments. Can I have one more say, please? I, I, can I have one more? If one? you keep it brief. Okay. Well, and, and wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Real brief. I don't, I don't want this to be No, 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 an it's argument. not. It's not. I just want to go to a few. No, it's not an argument. I just wanted to make one thing clear about Airbnb. It's nothing to do with any neighbors or anything. Okay. They do vet. Um, there was a comment um, by Ms. Enright that they do not vet. Airbnbs not only vet our guests, I have conversations with my guests leading up to them coming. I know who's coming to my house, which is what is important. My neighbors don't need to know who's coming to my house. I have personal property rights. Right. Um, no, 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 that's my point, is that they are vetted. We do know who they are. Not only are they vetted, vetting the guests, they also vet me and Lori as a host. So they have our background. Before a person comes in in an Airbnb, they have to scan their license into the system. They have a background check. I get to see all the reviews. So I get to see all of that. I just wanted to make clear because they had said That's there was okay. somebody. No, I appreciate okay. that. But right now, they're prohibited in this community. So thank you for the information. Right. But I want to make sure because we're asking for them to not be prohibited that the correct facts are displayed and the correct facts right. were not be. That's all. I just want to make sure that people are educated on exactly what an Airbnb is because when somebody gets up and says, we don't know who's coming in. They're not vetted. That's false. We do know who's coming in. Thank I have their background. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to. Yes, sir, would you like to speak sure, on a non council, a non agenda item? Yes. Please come to the microphone, state your name and address, sir. Sure. Uh, my name is Don Watson. I'm at 332 Hawkswell. I'm behind Blanche Sims. And I just give you an update. I went to the school board uh, and I also learned that the school, so we're talking about the Blanche Sims reconstruction and my concern as an immediate neighbor, one of 40 neighbors to Blanche Sims, my comment to the school board was, I'm your neighbor. And they don't have any responsibility as I understand it. They follow the state of Michigan rules for drainage and how they build out. And so I'm just coming to you to say, can we get an engineering, can I help you guys get an engineering design plan that the school board has not been able to provide yet? And I don't know what the circumstances are. But, yeah, so Joe and I have talked, but there's not an engineering drainage design plan that I can put my hands on. Maybe it's forthcoming. But that would be forthcoming. That would be a requirement of development of that site, sir. It, it would be, but I think they're ready to go to bid, and I haven't seen a, a design plan. So just as a concerned neighbor and being a village resident, I think it's in everybody's interest. Mr. Lamb. Uh, just as a comment, I, I had uh, two years ago on our development project in Northville, we, we abutted uh, single-family residential around the school, and um, 
the school board told us that they didn't have any duty um, to provide us with any information um, because the school districts operate independently. So I, I want to say that this gentleman may have a, a valid concern and he may not be able to get this information. So I think he may have quite a valid concern and that maybe Mr. Young can help him if possible. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't. I, I think everybody good. wants to get along. I, I just think that an engineering plan for drainage makes sense. Right. Plainly, Thank you. Mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. So, right. can I We've comment got on the air information? Can I comment on the Airbnb? If you'd like. It's very brief. I use Airbnb everywhere. We're going for uh, some period of time to, to, and we use Airbnb all the time. I find that the way they work and function could be very good, but I have wondered myself when I show up at a residence and I'm in a building or a complex. I wonder what do the neighbors think. Right. And I don't have an answer to it, so you know. I, Thank you, sir. Some caution would be good. Yep. Thanks, John. Thank you, Barry. All right. Thank you. Fine. Having no one else, I'm going to close call the public. <coughs> Moving on, consent agenda. We have 11, Mr. Land. I would request to take um, item uh, one. Um, off of the consent agenda. I would, we have 11 items this evening, and I would entertain that as a motion to allow 10 and remove one or pull one. Anybody else have one they want pulled? Okay. If you'd like to make that as a motion, sir. Yes, I would. I'd like to make a motion to remove the property insurance claim office so I can ask Mr. Young a couple of questions. I'll support. So we have a motion of support for the other 10 items. I'll list them or read them. Contributions to medical plan annual cost limitation. Item three, set public hearing on parks and recreation master plan from Monday, January 25th at 7.30. Item four, Lake Orion New Year resolution run. Item five, approval of those council regular meeting minutes. Item six, those council special meeting minutes. Item seven, those council special meeting minutes. <coughs> item eight, planning commission draft regular meeting minutes from November 18th. Item nine, board of zoning appeals regular meeting minutes from October 7th. Item 10, board of zoning appeals special draft meeting minutes from October 28th. And item 11, parks and recreation advisory committee regular meeting minutes October 26th. Mr. Young. I just want to clarify on the motion to remove item one, to place it at the end of the consent agenda for consideration. It's going to be discussed right after we accept these okay. other 10. We made a motion, so we have to vote on that motion first. To Thank remove you. it. And to remove it? To remove it, okay. you have to vote on it. Yes. Okay, so before we, move, before we do the consent agenda, we do have to vote on that first. Motion. I understand. Okay, I just wasn't Thank sure I was clear. <laughs> <laughs> So, all those in favor of just removing item one from the consent agenda, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Motion passed. Now I entertain a motion to accept the other 10, which I thought you did in your regular motion. I move to accept the other 10 on the consent agenda as presented by Manager Young. Support. All those in favor, please end with aye. 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 Opposed? None. Let's discuss this property insurance claim offer, DPW building, now. Mr. Uh, Mr. Young, I, I, um, I recall speaking with you on several occasions about <coughs> finding out whether the insurance company was making us a fair offer for settlement of the claim. I never heard back. Were you able to solicit some bids or get some prices from some other contractors to verify that the insurance company's offer was fair? We attempted several contractors, but none of them accepted a request to come out. They're too busy with too many other jobs, and we tried to get anyone to come out to give us a quote, but the problem is they know they're not going to get a job from it. It's just a replacement cost, and so uh, they hired a consulting firm who does this, the insurance company, this, uh, the Olds Professional Center, 
that's who they hired to come up with the cost analysis in this detail. So that was the only person who was found to give us an estimate for, and it has to be replaced in kind inside. We can't relocate it. The insurance play is replacement. So that's why we needed to know what it would it cost to replace the building as it is. And that's where they came up with the 34,000 total. So I'm, I will ask you, do you recommend that we accept this based on your due diligence? Yes. That this is a fair settlement from the insurance company? Yes. I you, recommend that we accept it. Then you've done the best you could trying to find. I'm sorry? You've done the best you can with the Yes, we did. Okay. That's what I want to know. Yes. Mm. So what's your status at this time, sir? Would you like to make a motion to accept? Can you just receive and file? Receive and file? If you want. Yeah, I, I will then go with the, I recommend uh, to receive and file the property insurance net claim. Does this mean that you're going to accept the claim, Joe? It says receive and file, but shouldn't it say to accept the claim offered by the... Either way, they're, they're sending us a check regardless, so... What well, you had to like sign the thing to accept the claim. Did Not you? yet. <laughs> you will, won't you? Yeah. Okay. And so then I, I move to um, authorize the village manager to accept and receive okay. the insurance settlement uh, as proposed. Support. Discussion. The only thing I had that was hanging out there for me, I'm going to support it. I, I don't think we did a deep enough dive on it, though because at one point I talked to the insurance agent and he, I said, do you not provide for temporary solutions? So oh. we should be in our insurance policy said, yes, we do. So what's that? I agree. I don't know. We have a motion on the floor. We have support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Item 7, approval of the agenda. <clears throat> No items will be discussed after 10.30 p.m. unless council board commissioners vote to continue the meeting. We have no other changes in our agenda at this time. Move to approve the agenda as presented. Support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Item 8, public hearings, CDBG 2022 public hearing. Mr. Young. Yes, council, uh, we receive federal community development block grant monies, CDBG for program year 22, and part of that process we have to have a public hearing to seek requests for the use of that money. The total amount of money that's allocated for this upcoming year fiscal 22 is $9,546. And as in the past, there's a limit of 30% that you can spend on public services which is $2,863, which leaves a balance of $6,683 for uh, various other projects should the village choose to do that. In the past, we have awarded the 30% allocation between Haven and uh, FISH, the food bank substance payments. We've alternated it. And this past year, we awarded the, the balance of 6000 for uh, lead line replacements. And again, these are for lead lines in the... Um, shaded area in the map that are a low modern income area, which there are properties in there that would need to be replaced. And this would be an eligible item for this. Uh, there are, I think I put it in the packet, there's several possible uses for these monies, but this to me would be the most significant pressing one is to get those lead lines replaced. So this is just a public hearing uh, tonight. To open the public hearing, I don't know if anybody's here. I don't see anybody I recognize from Haven or Fish. But there is a letter from Haven in the packet. I was expecting one from Fish, but we, we didn't get any. We need so to include them, just to make note of the letter during the public hearing. So if you could open the public hearing, we can do that and then close up. Okay, so I'm going to open the public hearing and I'll make note of the letter from November 8th of 2021 from Haven making a statement about how they service our community in many, many different ways. Anybody like to speak with regards to the public hearing on CBDG funds and the appropriation? This is also an agenda item later. Yes. 
seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. The only comment or question I do have, Ms. Young, is I believe there's another item to this equation that's missing. You say 30% we can allocate, but I believe there's another item to the equation that says it's, it can't be below like a certain amount, like $3,500. Right. There's been prohibition, or the text, the amendment, in, or the, the, the text in this rule, this law, is fail or is not good enough for our community. We have not been able to contribute to help and assist um, some of these charitable organizations because of that rule. And so, can you help me? What is that last part that you did not state? The thirty percent. But there's something else to it. That, well, they. There, there is language about if you have assessments, it can't be uh, lower than 3500 You can't split the money up. It's got to be $3,500. You can't give it out to four or five people. You can only give it to one. Could you read it? Or is that just what you believe it said? Do you no, that is the case, but I can get the documentation for that. Because they had a problem with people giving 1000 here, 1000 there, 1000 there. They said, no, no, no. 3500 Mr. Narsh. Uh, just a quick question. And so we're allocating funds for the replacement of lead pipes in this yes. as well. Um, it's my understanding that there are federal dollars coming to us through Michigan for that exact purpose. Yes. And that that is actually coming rather quickly. Hopefully. Um, it, well, it's coming. Um, and, and I've been told that from our state representative and that uh, we can access those dollars. Actually, we should be doing that now by sending a letter through Oakland County stating that we have, uh, you know, this desire to partake in that fund. Um, since that's the case, is there such an urgency that maybe there'd be something else well, that would be better well, suited for these dollars? Well, yeah, in your packet, I did provide a list of potential other areas that... And I'm just offering that. I, I'm not trying to interrupt if there's an urgent need or an emergency to replace those lines right, right. now, right. but knowing there's federal funding coming yeah. for those, is there another fairly urgent need in our community yeah. that we could also address? Right. That would be maybe possibly the debate in the, the next agenda on the next one. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, I'll leave that for the next agenda item. Mr. Lane, uh, you have something for right now? I, I was just clarifying your comment. And Joe, it says here 30% limit for public services of 2863, right. and then Ken brought up that there may be a $3,500 minimum threshold. So, it's if how would we give the money if there's a 3500 minimum threshold? It's if for those that receive much more money than we do, we get a very small amount. Other communities get 50, 60, 100,000, and so what they've said, the $3,500 limit is you can't have a contract below 3500 Are we exempt from that yes, rule? because of the 30%, of correct. There's, a, there's some language that says we're exempt from that rule right. because of the it, dollar amount. It can't amount. be any less than. I mean, if you want to pay, no, we can only pay 30%. The most you can pay is 35%. So there's an exception for our small no. community because of the small dollar amount, or they just allow it, overlook it? Is there an exception, you, or do no, they just overlook it? No, it's not it? that way. Are you saying that for communities who say they get $50,000, they can do 30% of that? They could split it between two, but as long as there was a minimum of, of 3,500 right. for each one. Right. So because we're below 3,500, we cannot split it. So we are we can go up to a max of 30 percent. But two different situations. We don't have ten thousand dollars. That okay. Thirty percent is not ten thousand dollars. No. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. So, very. It is confusing. But um, yeah, we can talk about that later. The allocation later. If we just want to close the public. So. Hearing. We have the public hearing open right now for CDGB expenditures. We'll close public hearing. We're going to move on. Thank you. Item two, preliminary plan review, 141 Elizabeth Street, apartments, PUD, Mr. Young. Yes, council, this evening we have before you, as recommended by the Planning Commission, uh, development at 144 Elizabeth Street. Uh, this is a preliminary plan approval, similar to what we did with the Eamon Center uh, two months ago. Uh, this particular project um, is um, on the same street, Elizabeth Street. I'm sorry, it's on Elizabeth Street. It's uh, 16 units, uh, two uh, four 
well, each floor has got uh, four bedroom, four two bedroom, and four three bedroom units. So these are two and three bedroom unit uh, complexes. Um, Mr. Reard is here, and someone else from your um, company is here to speak on behalf of the development, but it's here for your, your, your consideration. Uh, this is the public hearing, I'm sorry. This is the public hearing part of um, that matter. But it's been referred and recommended to the Planning Commission as was submitted um, last week and recommended on to you for your consideration. Um, this is the only discussion on this item tonight. It's just the public hearing for... Well, there is an item on 9B for discussion. But this is not directly pointed towards that address and that development. It's just a standard HUD amendment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm you know, I'm sorry. No, that's general text amendment. 26, so we'll open a public yeah. hearing for the PUD development at 141 Elizabeth Street Apartments, which has been before the Planning Commission, and it's been... Um, determined or pushed on to those councils. So this is the first step of public hearing. Would anybody like to address the council or the property owner regarding this development? It's a 16 unit apartment complex. Do you want to speak? Rob or not? It's up to you. Not necessary unless you'd like to, sir. Uh, if you want to ask me questions, I guess. I don't, I think everybody here knows me, knows our buildings, what we, we built, or what we've, you know, sold a building in Valentino's, we know our house, we're, we do a good job, we put a lot in this community. So I live at 328 South Broadway, Lake Orion. My name is Robert, the last name is Reard, R-E-I-G-H-A-R-D. So if you have questions for me, I'm here to answer them, uh, but I don't think I need to sell you on anything, you already know me. Well, the function, or the, what's meant tonight is just the public hearing. Right. So, I see nobody else from the public wishing to discuss, so we'll close the public hearing and this will come back before us again for the review. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, moving on, proposed ordinance number 26.104. Tax Amendment to the Zoning Ordinance, Article 11, Plan Unit Development, Tax Amendment, Mr. Young. Uh, this is a public hearing, again, to, it is recommended from the Planning Commission uh, to update and streamline the Plan Unit Development, uh, Section Article 11, the PUD and under Zoning Ordinance, and then, uh, the Planning Commission has worked on this since June. There's been a couple of iterations of it. Um, it was streamlining it. It did have some substantive changes in the policy, particularly relative to density. Uh, that uh, right now the uh, ordinance is being proposed to change the um, 1.5 times. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, you know, stop. That's all right. I'm just, I know we're going to have this as an agenda item again. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I forgot. It's public so, hearing. Sorry. Public hearing. <laughs> sorry. Would anybody like to address this council on public hearing? It is as an agenda item uh, and item B1 for change, but this is public hearing. President, members of the council, James Cummins, 228 Atwater Street, Lake Orion. I'm not here this evening to speak as a member of the Planning Commission. I'm here to speak as a licensed professional architect, planner, and builder with regards to this change in the ordinance. I believe that the ordinance should be changed to remove the language that allows the council to arbitrarily um, convey additional density to properties um, that exceed the 15 units per acre that would be allowed by our zoning ordinance. Are we speaking about, am I talking about the right parcel here? I didn't get a chance to do this. So I would, I would recommend that you take the language out 
that allows additional densities to be granted above and beyond what the zoning ordinance itself allows. I think what you're saying is is to remove the 20% arbitrary. Uh, uh, that is correct. Uh, village council approval of density. That's correct. I believe that the council is granting a special right conveying additional density to a developer or a property owner uh, on a specific parcel of property in excess <coughs> of what the is normally allowed under the ordinance, which would be 15 units per acre, and then you're going to allow an additional 20%. <clears throat> I think that by ordinance that the density of 15 units per acre is generous in a village of our size. And I think to allow additional density that, that provides a special um, consent to various landowners uh, puts that developers coming into the, into the community perceive that they're going to get an additional 20% density on the properties that they come into. And I think that that's, that's not something that's good to do. Um, Overdevelopment um, with our, within our community would rob the community of its old village character. And I think that the, that the densities as set will help, will help protect overdevelopment, overtaxing of the infrastructure, and create even more traffic problems than we already have in our small community. There are not that many parcels of property left that we need to be exchanging additional 20% of density on those properties. I think they can be adequately developed with the densities that are allowed within the ordinance uh, as it stands. So I would request that you vote to remove that 20% that you currently have the ability to distribute to other to developments. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else like to speak on this in the public hearing? Again, it will be an agenda item here shortly for council debate. I'll close the public hearing. Move on to item nine. Agenda items for consideration, financial matters. Mr. Young. Uh, the invoice register and bill approval. Here before you this evening, we have a bill run December 9th in the amount of $35,535.60. An invoice registered December 9th in the amount of $107,905.89. And to receive and file the DDA bill amounts of $18,181.59. And also recently even filed the November credit card report totaling $4,267.34. Entertain a motion. I move to approve December 9th check run of payroll bills paid November 23rd and December 7th at $35,535.60 in the December 9th, 2021 invoice register report in the amount of $107,000. $905.89 and receive and file the DDA bills of $18,181.59 and the November credit card report of $4,267.34. I'll send you support. Okay, great. Support by Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb, what's your question? <laughs> My question is I want to thank Mr. Young for. Uh, making the DDA bills to receive and files, even though they're included in this motion. I appreciate that. And then I had one question was, the um, Meeks Park Bridge $1,110, what, where do we stand on that? What are we paying for on the Meeks Park Bridge to know I can for a thousand? Uh, um, it's a payment to me, no I can frost? Yes, please. For their preliminary injury, I can pull the invoice. I just wonder what the description was, just, we're, we haven't had a uh, we haven't had a report committee meeting or a report in some time.
for, um, let me see, this is for MS4 for math, general engineering. Okay, let's see, for $2,100? $1,110. $1,110. One more bill. I have four separate invoices here. Okay, here we go. It was for uh, the contract amount was twenty thousand dollars. The ten percent, the project's ten percent complete, so they build um, for the preliminary engineering work. It was eleven thousand one hundred. They're billing for ten percent of that preliminary engineering work. Okay, progress payment. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, Ms. Rutt. Um, just two things. One, um, dates. I know I mentioned before dates on here. That would be helpful. So when you have multiple uh, invoices and we can set, because there's no date on here for that. Uh, so having dates and oh, adding yes. dates back onto here would be great. And also, like, I appreciate the credit card um, transactions out like this, but I still have lots of questions because... I don't know what was bought at Costco for $104 or $157 or at Amazon for $60. Um, that's not helpful for me. For all no. I know, somebody could go take a joyride down to Costco by themselves, you know, a mm. couple boxes of right. Cheez-Its and throw it in the car and say, hey, there's some snacks. Okay. Um, so I know in one of our statements, we did get a little bit more detail. So going back to that would be helpful. No problem. We can... Thanks. Provide more details. Okay. Is that it? We have a motion on foreign support. Roll call. Narsh? Yes. Rudd? Yes. Fanport, please? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Motion carries 6 0. Item two, finance reports, November 2021, Mr. Young. Yes, Council, let's see the uh, budget and balance sheet statements as of November. Uh, I put some notes on here about the uh, census impact, as I mentioned at the last meeting. We're still on uh, no further update on that uh, at this mo moment as far as with the effective date and the ARP money, which we uh, were made aware of. But, um, We'll be reviewing this now that we got the audit completed and looking and projecting what our year-end balance is and if there's any further adjustments at this point in time that we'll be uh, bringing back to the council on. And um, we say now we can have the audit, we can have the balance sheet show year closed so we don't have that issue going forward on the balance sheet. So I don't know if there's any questions, comments. Or the motion would be to receive and file, correct? Yes. Yes. The um, the uh, so the so the so the ARP funds, the hundred sixty six thousand dollars ARP funds, we're going to match those now with the new federal money coming in. That's that what, what I'm anticipating because a lot of the grants require a ten percent match. Yes. So that'll be coming up in the spring. They said next year for the grants, the state and federal grants, and we we could even be able to for some county money too. Which we're looking into because they got all all have money to spend. Did we send the, the county thing that Jerry mentioned? Did you send in the request for the county funds coming through? I haven't yet, but that's on the list. Of that's things. on there, our list to get to the county. Is there a deadline for that? I'm not sure. I have to find out. Okay. I'll talk to our our county commissioner and find out. Who is our county commissioner, Joe? Mike Gingel. Mike, Mike Gingel. G I N G E L. Gingel. Oh. Is that it, sir? I move to receive and file financial reports for November 30, 2021. Support. Any more discussion? All those papers present, get the aye. 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 Opposed? CDBG 2022 fund allocation. Right. Yeah, the council, we um, see it's uh, page, page seven and eight in, in the, well, it's not your council package, but there's a list of eligible projects from acquisition of public facilities, public services, housing, economic development. Um, in the past, we've used 
block grant money to put in handicap ramps at the intersections, for example. Uh, we may have done it for the ADA doors, I don't know, on this community. Uh, I mean, there's a number of potential projects that could be considered. Uh, the one thing, um, I have to have an A grant application in by Friday, there's a something. Uh, we can go back and reprogram, change how we want to use the money, because this money won't be available for another year. So, uh, and we could even reprogram last year's, you know, the current year, because we don't have the money. Um, I, think we, I think we finally got it allocated. But that was for code enforcement last year. And um, so we're getting some of that money back. But this, and then if we had fish last, Fisher Haven last year. But last year we gave it to fish, this current year. So I don't know if you want to consider uh, the same with fish or go with Haven this year. Uh, that's one question. And then secondly, uh, there's another area that we you would like to provide for. We can do that now or... Um, you know, again, we're going to need grant match money for some of these projects. So this, I, I'm per, I will double check if we can use this as part of our 10% match too, is a possibility. But I'll find that out. But in the meantime, we got. Unfortunately, it's only seven. You know, less than seven thousand dollars to identify uh, and. Uh, there are a number of possible areas. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any shelf-ready projects that this minutia. Can I to do that? Yes, yeah. Mr. Nars. Um, and, and the reason I raise that question okay. is, and I'll ask a question: um, Do we? Ha how many homes have we identified in the village that are in need that have lead? There's around. We think around 300. But but have we identified any yet that are shovel ready because they have led? Oh, we have we have sixty or so that we know are. Okay. And the other ones that was part of the water main project. Remember, we said we do the water main first, then go back. And when we, we did, did repair the, some of them, but not all of them. Okay, and I'm assuming because we knew that those specifically had lead, we did testing. I mean, I volunteered oh, yeah. for that the water yeah. testing. And did yeah. those uh, testing indications uh, come back? Uh, at the above level no, for lead? They were at zero. Okay. There's so, only one line we found in the village which was totally lead. And we put a purifier on that for the moment, and it's fine now. It's at zero. So currently we have no one that is above a zero no, lead level correct. in their water in the village. That, and and the, only, the only reason I raise that, it isn't that I don't think this is an important issue. I think it is, and I think we've got to resolve that. Um, the federal government is doing that, and uh, it's my understanding we're going to get a lot of money right. for specifically. That's one of the pillars for which we can use these right. funds. So if there's something else on the list, I'm just saying. Yeah. No, I understand, but again, we may need a 10% match, and this could help with the 10% match possibly. Right. It's, not, it's not based on <clears throat> if we've detected lead in the lines. It's based on if there's a lead line. Well, I understand that. I, what I was trying to qualify is do we have a health risk at the moment? And if we're getting zero at every one of these, then we don't. Right. Um, and that th those dollars are coming in to change all of them. Yes. And okay. That, that's all I was concerned about is that there right. isn't an immediate public health risk. And Mr. Young, you told me that we've identified 142. I'm sorry? 142 is what I had been told before that we know of. That the report we submitted, I thought, I'm recalling, I think it was like 382. I'll have to double check the exact number. I know we had 60 or more from the water main project that we did do, and then we identified based on the age of the water main and the age of the house, right. Right. highly likely that they have, right. could have lead line. And not to be punitive in looking at this, but 60, 683, would that even change one house? I mean, I don't know. Not Probably at the not. rates. Right. That's, that, it, right. Yeah. So I, yeah. One yeah, I'm trying to look at, is there another urgent need or more important in the community that will benefit the most amount of people? Right. Yeah. That, that's well, all. Well, the well, other thing. Until we shake out the, yeah. the ARPA, the AARPA, and also the federal government match, we should help our community the best we can yeah. with right. the fund dollars. And I like fish. Fish is so local. Right. It's like the money staying local. Haven is county. And I know they help a lot of people. 
but if I were to have a desire, I'd say let's help both. Yeah, I, I was just leading right into that. I, are there any other, you know, reading the criteria, the national objectives here? Yes. We haven't had a urgent community you know, need, but it seems like it's towards benefiting people, particularly low-income people. Yes, that's what it and, is. And I've been all through this village, okay, looking at the different properties, and there are low-income people here. Well, we only have one area in the village that's on that map. The southwest corner of the village is the only area that qualifies, and that's where the money has to be spent. So, sir, yeah, so are there any other government, are there any other groups in our community at all that, that do shelter, food bank, anything other than Fish this? and Love, Inc. are the main ones. Fish and who? Love, Inc. And, and they coordinate the their efforts. Okay. So I would, I would be, since this seems to be the objective, I, I would think we should solicit these places right. to apply. Right, and we do, we, 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 we can't, we do that, okay. Yeah, I mean, the lead, like we have to do said, a contract. Lead, you could probably replace two lead services with Maybe. the $6,700 the end. Short ones. Yeah. <laughs> but we can, I would rather feed some people or help some homeless or rescue some children or something. Yeah. So could the money be split? Could it be half the hat cave and half the fish? No, that's why, no. So it's got to be one of the other projects. If, so if we can more, only. If we had $7,000, we could give 3500 to one and thirty five to the other. That's, that's how we could get money to vote. But we don't have that much. And we can only spend 30%, so our hands are tight. But the funds are 9500 Yeah, but only 30% can go to got public it. service. That's that formula again. Yeah, it's. Yeah. it's and that's because the, the allocate balance is 6683. It doesn't include the nine. Mr. Hobbs. So you, you gave the fish last time, right? Yes. Okay, so it's Haven's turn. If that's what you okay, feel the priority is. That's how I was thinking about the whole thing, so. Yeah. You can't split it? It's their turn. No, we can't. So I entertain a motion unless people get more discussion. Uh, one more item is, is, are there any you know poor people in the village that are considered slum or blighted housing that we could you know, have it to do a home repair well, or well, something like that, or is that there, difficult? Part? There's another program countywide for minor home repair, and people can apply for that. This is on, on top of this program. I, I, I was thinking about the blights. We had a lot of talk no, at the public hearing about these blighted houses that are yeah. blighted and they can't right. do anything with them. Is there any, you know, blighted? I hate to, you know, sound a meeting, but little old person in a I mean, house. you can award all the money to minor home repair, and we don't have to mess with it. I mean, administratively or any. I mean, you have, this is, you could say, we want to have, we want to have, and that's what the, I believe, Orange Township sends their money back to the county for blighted home needs, preferably in this township, obviously. So we could, that is another option I forgot to mention. Because we, this is what we've always done. But you could refer all the money back to the county for minor home repair. But it's not guaranteed to come back to homes in well, your municipality. Well, if their people apply, they would. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But and we get a report apply. to that effect. So can, we fund, can we fund the one, like the fish or the haven, and then give the other money back? For minor home repair, you could do that also, yes. You could. Give the other money to who? You could give the 30% for public services and give the balance to minor home repair. Back to the county. Yeah, but I can't work with, I believe. I want to know. It's, it's, it's listed well, here. No, 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 no. Oh. I'm saying, Mr. Young made a statement, I believe the township does this, da 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 I would like to look into it and understand the program before I say let's yeah. do that. Okay. You could, That's all. And so you right could, now he's looking for paperwork to get fish taken care of, correct? I'm sorry? Fish, you're looking to get that 30% dispersed. You're looking to get that taken care of. You want to get that fulfilled, correct? If whatever the council wants to do with the money, you're allocating how you want this money to go, and I'm just going out what we've done in the past. I might, I might, I know this is one other item overlooked in the discussion is, is the money can also be donated to public services, youth services at the county. We donated back to youth services, which yeah. go to the low-income children. Okay. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, but it's again the thirty percent limit. Yes. So we get one thirty percent. 
and then the remainder That's, it's got to be on is facilities the, improvements minor home repair yeah, housing. I was looking for yeah. It earlier and yeah it's that's what I'm trying to get yeah. So you can put 30% in okay, public services. Yeah, you get That's what I was okay. looking for. Well, yeah. Okay, I think Doug's got a motion to put it to Haven. Or recommended to Haven. Uh, let me throw that into a motion. Is I'd like to mo make a motion that we uh, fund 30% uh, to Haven uh, this year. And I am very familiar with both. Uh, we, we do have fish and we've got um, also Love Inc. And we've got a lot of really great, uh, you know, and I know those needs are covered. So. I'm going to say uh, request that we donate the 30% uh, to Haven and then the additional to the, um, uh, I'm sorry, Mike had mentioned uh, Councilmember Lamb, the uh, housing blight. Is he the minor home minor repair, home repair. Or youth services? So. Minor home repair. Yeah, minor home repair or youth services. We could. I guess I would recommend the youth services. I mean, again, it's back to people, so. Um, um, that's public services. That's not. That's not. Oh, it's not part of the thirty percent. Oh, okay. That's okay. Great. Let's get out of that. Let's go back to the my home repair. Uh, all right. My motion is to thirty percent to Haven, and the remainder to the my home repair program. There can't be a minor home program. That's what he just said. For the public youth, it's got to be either meet an urgent community need or aid in the elimination of slum or blight. So I, I would recommend we go with meet an urgent community need and find something in the our community that urgently needs. Is that correct, Mr. Young? We can't do the My Home Repair for the 68 or 66? Yes, we can. We can do that. And, and Oxford Township does, I mean, I know Oxford Township, I know Orient Township. Okay, as long as we- benefit it in the community, in their home. As long as qualify. we can, my motion is to do the 30% to Haven with the remainder balance of 6683 to the My Home Repair. If that is an allowable expenditure, that's my motion. I'll support. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Lamb. Yes. Narsh? Yes. Rutt? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Motion carries 6 0. Item 4 Greens Park hours fees, Mr. Young. Um, oh, the Greens Park. Okay. Um, yes, Council, the Parks and Rec Committee is recommending uh, fees for the upcoming year. Uh, the only change, and Teresa, please correct me if I'm wrong, but was to um, keep the passes the same. But the only change was to add a event daily rate of $500 for any organization that would take the park and not provide allow for any um, admission charges. And um, I think that was. And then there was also the um, recommendation for the Pelton's Point dock oh, boat passes right. as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, the discussion that came out of the Parks Committee, uh, two different venues, two different recommendations. The, the one that the Parks Committee ultimately decided on recommending is that the, the boat permits currently are $25 a slip um, or for your permit for the boat docks. There are six of them there, three hour limit. So they've been selling out every year. Uh, last year, last three years, 150 permits and a lot of people were on a wait list for them. So the, the recommended motion was to increase it to $75, which is a significant increase, but also to include a Greens Park uh, pass with the purchase of the um, the boat permit. There's an alternate as well of um, doing just a $40, $40 um, dock pass and increase the amount of passes sold. I'm not a boat owner. I do not know how hard it is to get a spot on a weekend during the week. Uh, but it seemed to many of us that if there was a waiting list or you know that kind of demand for a boat permit, that an increase could be justified. There could also be a middle ground there if you wanted to discuss that, but that was the recommendation that came out. So the increase, the $500 per, per day fee for a large event that uses the park without charging admission fees or entrance fees was a new um, 
fee, we have like, you know, if somebody wants to come and have a party for half a day or full day, we have those fees, but um, something that uses the entire park is a lot different because it requires more hours, lifeguarding hours, it requires um, that we not sell passes for the day, and so decreases our revenue overall while increasing usage and wear and tear on the park. So that was the recommendation for that. And then the fee would be a donation to the Friends of Lake Orion Village Park, a $500 donation. So like Brave the Way, for example. And they use the, the Friends use the money for maintenance and repairs? Yep, right. improvements on the park. I move to, um, uh, I move to uh, raise the uh, boat dock permit fee to $75 and to include the uh, annual park membership in that $75 fee and to um, add the $500 per fee uh, per use fee for the village parks for the each day for each day yeah for right. a major event right. that uses the entire park mm -hmm. and the the boat slips often look empty just as a seg segue you know, so I, I think there's so much demand we would actually have to start implementing a lottery system before yes. passes um, so I think raising the fee might drive down the demand slightly. But that's my move. I'll support it. Debate, questions, answers? I have a comment. I just have a question of, as a point of order. All of this is included in the resolution in the packet, and um, it, that resolution also includes all the hours and days the lifeguards are there. That's why we're asking for the adoption of the resolution, not the change of the fees, because so just so there's clarity that that is actually what the motion is, or just these three items. So the motion includes the changing of the fees? Because I yes, look at those the as the resolution being does. Option one, option two, yeah, option three. Yeah, and it'll include this, the first option. Them. Right. But it's here in the package. So the motion, I, I, I would draw my motion and I will move to adopt option one. one. Yeah. And where is that list in option one, please? On packet page. Got it. I see it. Yeah. Mm. There, Mr. President, if I may, there was a typo on the resolution regarding the summer season. The, the, the park is required, uh, summer season is the Friday before Memorial Day to the Monday after Labor Day. So it was just a typo. Oh, so we do last year. <laughs> There's also a typo under summer season that says seasonal pass $5 for a family and it's 20, which is what it was last year. $20. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Typo. Amend my motion to amend the motion <laughs> to include the two. And your support, support it? Yes, support, support. Okay. I have a comment. I, I don't think, I, I'm not going to support the $75 fee. Um, I believe that we won't communicate it well to the public. It hasn't been thought through. I believe what will happen is people will come and park their boat at Greens Park saying, I paid for a pass and it's full at the other end. I don't care. And what do we do with that? So I think it's going to have another problem to it. I recommend that we stay with the $40 increase and look at this with some strategic planning for the future. And I don't think we've got that right now. And all too often we move forward with things like this and it ends up being, well, what do we do? I don't know. You got a poor lifeguard down there saying they've got the pass. They say it's full over there and they have rights to this park. They're parking here. Mm -hmm. The pass doesn't give them a right to the parking at the dock. No, doesn't. But Ken it's saying they will at Green's assume Park, they do. It doesn't give them a right to park right. at Green's Park. At Green's Park. Only, but people will say, wait a minute. And I believe that park, or that is that dock labeled police parking only? On one side. one side. The other side has always been available for people to come right. in gotcha. and go okay. and stuff. They'll, they'll park by the seawall up by the basketball courts. And they'll park at the main dock. We've already had that problem. It will be a bigger problem. I don't think there's enough uh, of a program into this right now, so I won't support it. That's just my comment. I, I, I support the, the increase. But well, to combine I, them, I don't think we're ready. But that's I'm, I'm willing to amend my motion to $50 for the boat slip only and remove the park fee from it. So I'll go to 50, I'll amend my motion to make the fee for the dock 50 bucks 
I think that's a nice for order. slip use. For slip use I'm only, and the rest of the resolution can stand. I'll support that amendment. So, and that's no arc pass included. Correct. So it's, it would be like option two, but yeah. it being $50. Do yes. we still want, do we want the increase in the maximum passes sold to 200 or leave it at 150? Leave, leave it at 150. We haven't had any problems, right, Joe? Do you want more passes? Yeah. Are we having any complaints? I'd rather, yes. no. Have we had complaints? They can only stay there for three hours. That's. Have we had complaints about not being able to get a pass or complaints about not being able to get a parking spot. Some, like, what are the complete the there's, complaints? There've been some <clears throat> tickets issued for people parking illegally at the dock on the side. There's there are times, but the demand for passes is much greater than any conflict. Other than what the police department told me. Uh, so I, I I suggest we just increase the fee this year, and then we'll see yeah. how many problems yeah, we can fault. address it next year. That's fine. Too much change. That's your motion. Yes, sir. All right. Is it support? 150 yes. passes. Roll call. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, Say right. that again. What, what is it? Option two for option two, but fifty dollars oh. per pass and 150 Pass. passes. So are we back to option two now? No. No. I'm well, confused. Well, yes. So his motion is to adopt the resolution at, with a modified option two that it be, well, I guess it would be an option three. $50 okay. at a maximum of 150 right. passes is his motion. 150 passes. Okay, thank right. you. And no Greens Park pass. Correct. And no Greens no, Park. They're okay. separate. Yep. Okay. Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Van Portley? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rutt? Yes. Motion carries 6 0. And the passes are available tomorrow morning at 8 30, Village Hall Office, for $50 <laughs> because you can get in line and get, because we already have people asking for them. Do you get them online, Joe? No, they wait in line to get them. I don't think you can get them online. Oh, so you're you telling might. me there's going to be people waiting well, at 8 their, in the morning they have tomorrow? To get their voter registration information. So there will be people waiting at 8 in the morning tomorrow in line to get, well. Oh. Thank you. Moving on. All right. Other items. One, first reading proposal ordinance number 26.104, text amendment to the zoning ordinance, article 11, planning and development, text amendment. And this is the item that we visited earlier in a public hearing. And now it comes to the council for acceptance or not. And so we have the information well. before us. Um, Mr. Young, if there's any additional brief you think you need to provide, well, please do I so did, now. I, we, we, we put the introduction and first and public hearing on the same meeting tonight. The adoption will be January 10th. Correct. Second reading and adoption on the 10th. So just to let you know that. And the issue regarding density, which is the most significant issue, is that it does eliminate the 20 percent it's out and it also provides that the 50 the 1.5 times may be considered not shall be but may be considered so that was the language changes where before the developer coming in would say i can i'm going to get one and a half if i show enough community benefit and then if I show enough community, then I could get 20% from the council, which gives them, well, here's what I should be targeting for. So if we don't, as, as Mr. Cummins pointed out, we're a small community, you know, we don't have, you know, we're only one square mile, half of which is a, a water. And do we want to have that over uh, development potential there because of that? So it's a policy change that you need to decide, is that something that you think is in the best interest. There's, we know we've had proposals with higher density and developing some blighted properties, such as the Emmy Center and the lumber yard, and we're getting some more on, uh, on the lake. Um, so there's a potential and that's driven by the market, but also by the policy we have, which says you can get, instead of 15 units an acre, you can get uh, 27 units an acre. So might we start with a motion for debate? I move right. to accept the plan unit development um, as stated with the following exceptions. 
um, that on page 9B1.8, section 11.03B density, that the residential uses shall be considered up to a maximum density of 1.5 times the units per gross area fraction thereof authorized in the residential underlying district in which the property is situated be struck from the proposed amendment. I, I need your help, sir. I need to, when you said 9B.1-A? 9B1.8, on the packet page, that's, I'm sorry. That's packet not, that's page a, number, though, please. Packet page 9B1. No, it's that on the is bottom. The section. Oh. It's on the bottom, but they're cut off they're on our Oh, it's cut off on their set, too. So. You know what section yeah. it is? It's the second page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ordinance. It's the second page of your packet. There's no page numbers Shoot. on my packet, guys. Sorry. All right, 11.03. <laughs> Correct. 11.03, oh, is it this one? Oh, yes. 11.03. 11. Okay. So it's under. I got it. Okay, you got it. Density, please read it again, sir. Uh, that the uh, density, permitted density for the project <clears throat> shall be based on the type of uses proposed in accordance with the um, following standards. Um, Residential uses shall be considered. Yes, I want to strike the part, residential uses shall be considered up to a maximum density of 1.5 times. The intention of my motion is to remove any density increases by PUD um, that are suggested in the ordinance. The reason I'm recommending that is that in the plan of development historically in the village of Lake Orion has been used for density increases only. Very, very, few applications have ever been to the benefit of the community, strictly really for the benefit of the development. By suggesting any increases in the PUD, it, it encourages the developers to ask for higher density. Um, the basis of the PUD, if we do not give them any up to maximums or 20%, then any PUD you can ask for any density you want. By the nature of the planned urban development, Mr. Young explained to me, just by submitting a planned urban development, I could ask for 300 times the density because the planned urban development is, in fact, a new ordinance. So even though in our PUD ordinance we save these specific requirements, because it is a PUD, we can modify them. Is that correct, Joe? You can amend any of this ordinance, yes. So any of this ordinance can be corrected by the PUD applicant himself. This is a very strange concept I've had trouble coming to grips with. So in order for the developers to not use this ordinance as leverage against the planning commission or the council by taking out all of the automatic increases, I'm not only, I'm totally in favor of taking the 20% discretionary out, but I'd also take, like to take out the 50% um, that's in here which Joe recommended we change the language on the 50% from. It says in here, considered up to is what's proposed. Right, consider up to 1.5 times. Right. Why, I don't think we should consider, I personally, my motion is, I don't think we should consider any increase in density over the zoning standards. I think we should let the developers or people proposing make the proposal to us. I don't think we should no, just I have see. this a 50% increase that they just have to check a couple of boxes and nobody wants to make waves and we rubber stamp. So sir, right now the per acre unit uh, ordinance states 15. Are you suggesting that it's 15 only and that's it? No, what I'm saying is that we, we just say in the PUD that the permitted density for projects of the type is per the zoning ordinance. Which would be 15 per acre. Yeah, and if they want to ask for more units in the, their PUD proposal, they can at that time do that. They can ask for anything in the PUD proposal, and then we can effectively review it. So what it really is, what you're saying, Mr. Lamb, is no cap. The 1.5 provides a cap. I believe that the 1.5 doesn't provide a cap. I believe the PUD could ask for more. And well, that's what I'm saying, no cap. 
because with a cap, you have 15 units per acre, and let's say it's two acres, that means they could ask for 44 or 45 units on two acres because there's a cap. You're saying they could come in and say, you know what, I need to get 90 in there, and here's the reason why, and if we all say that's great, then we go yes, and they get 90. That's the way it is now. The language is stated no, it's 1.5%. Mr. Young shaking his head no. This one provide 1.5% is not a cap, Joe. It's not a cap. Do we have a motion that we're debating, or is, is it yeah, yeah. Is a motion? Has it, been, has it been supported? I, I get, no, it has not been no, supported. No, it hasn't been. So we can debate this. Right. So we got a motion, and the motion was removed. I, we haven't seen support yet. Right, go ahead. I, remember, I don't remember what the motion was. Okay, yeah. so I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to okay. clarify some of the legalities of this. So I move to approve the PUD amendment as proposed. With the exception, I would also like to remove the 150% and bonus. Yes. Well. And as a clarification, you're not approving it, you're accepting it for a first reading. Correct. Uh, because I need a specific language you want deleted from here. That's that whole section. And it's not a 150% oh, no, I, I, I just need to know what, what needs to the come The motion out. is to accept ordinance and amendment, to accept the ordinance. That's where we got stuff on the Heman Center and I got To accept an ordinance for first reading and to schedule second reading in consideration for adoption yeah. in January. And between a first reading and a second reading, if you're going to make changes, you can, but I have to have the specific changes you want in the ordinance. He wants the second sec sentence stricken. The whole sentence? The whole sentence residential, from residential uses down to situated shall right. be considered to uh, yeah. that whole sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have a supporter? No. Just trying oh. to gain some. Do we have. Are you in second one here? That's almost a whole second thing. one of, of B. Section 11.03, yeah. item B, density. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to hold my debate here until we have a motion and support and we can have debate. Do we have support on this motion, support? Mr. Lamb? Did you support? No, I'm oh, not. Sorry. I'm okay. saying I'm trying to have a debate, but I'm trying to follow the rules here. We, we have a should have a support. Do we have support? No. We will, sir. Just or hang on a minute. Okay. Let this process play out. Oh, I'm trying to. You're going to support it? No. Okay. That doesn't mean you have to vote yes. But <laughs> no, I understand. You well, just need the support to bring it to the table. No, um, hang on. A just second, the please. support. I'd like to conduct this meeting if I could, please. Yeah. All right. So, we have a motion on the floor, and there's no support. So, the motion has failed. Mr. Young, you have a comment. What would you like to say, sir? Regarding the density, section B, the original draft back in June from McKenna kept the one and a half times. They took out the 20% item, which is shown on the next page, but I they inserted to a be sentence considered. under the one and a half times. It says the village council may permit an increase in density for project that demonstrates a significant public benefit. One sentence, no limit. And where are you referring to that, sir? It's, it's um, well, it was in the June draft, but that's what that 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 didn't say there's any limit. You know, it said there's one and a half times, but beyond that, there could there could be none because you you have the council has the total discretion to grant ten percent, twenty percent, or none. It's for whether or not you feel there's enough value, community benefit to warrant it. I guess I would so, like to then. I know it, means, I mean, it sends a target to the developer. I get it. So that's the problem. I get it. I'd, I'd like to make a motion then uh, to accept the ordinance, uh, the amendment of those, uh, text amendment of Article 11, unit plan development for the first reading schedule, second consideration uh, for January 10th, 2022, with this change is that we keep the 1.5% and that we keep the 20% discretionary for this council to decide when a development comes before us that the council would decide. That's my motion. With the, uh, with, with the language where it says uh, may request on the 1.5. And that's my motion. No support. 
Okay, debate. Um, at this time, I'd like to, uh, Councilman um, Luxinger uh, asked me to inform you that she supports the revised motion as presented by Mr. Young with the 20% off. She also asked if she could delay the vote on it until she was able to attend in person. I don't know appropriate protocol for that because she didn't give it well, in right. Yeah. In well, this is just the first reading. It's not adopting it. Yeah. Uh, he asked for amendment to this. I know, but it's amending it for the second reading. Correct. So we can hash it right. out again. Just, just for a point of clarity, you said in June the planning, uh, our planners included a sentence that allows for council. Is that in this one? Because I have not... Uh, it or would be in what was, there were four different versions. Could you so read it again, Joe? I think just read Well, I just want to know if it's in this current version. Because I have not. No, it's not in that. Okay. Version. No, it that's is not. not in my motion no, to include that. I'm keeping not. the 20%. Right. I just wanted to clarify that that was not in here, that I it did not, not miss that as you no, were reading I'm sorry that. sorry if I confused you. Okay. Yes. Mr. Knox. Okay. And the reason I believe that we need to keep this the way it is, for one thing, if we adopted the ordinance you have before you tonight that's being recommended, the last three developments and projects that everybody's applauding and we're looking at right, not everybody, but the majority of folks who are applauding that's gonna bring some really cool benefit downtown and some of the projects that we've already gotten downtown would not have passed. What we have is not a problem with density. What we have is limited space. And in our master plan, we want to have more residential. We have several small pieces of property. In Orion Township and Oxford Township, you can have 25 acre parcels and get beautiful homes and spread it all out. We, we do not have that option. The properties that we have left are going to be subject to developers that want to come in and develop and build something beautiful that's residential that fits the master plan. And that's bring more residential into the village. I can see us rejecting somebody that wants to come in and develop that and bring some really beautiful residential into the village. Uh, none of the developers will become because they, it's not a profit margin. The return on investment is going to be garbage. So what we get is storage units. Oh, we'll get them because the property owner has a right to sell his property. And now that'll fit the zoning and we got storage units. There's maybe some boat rental or uh, uh, you know, store your boat for the winter places. But you're not gonna get residential. We don't have 20 acre sites. I mean, I, I firmly believe that this council is educated enough, smart enough, savvy enough to make decisions based on what's in the best interest of our public and, and um, judiciously use that 20%. If you look at almost every development we've had that the village has right now that's residential has used this and it's a blessing and it's been a benefit to the community. I'm just saying that keep the 1.5, keep the 20% because the 20% is discretionary and now we're making the 1.5 discretionary. But if we take that away, we handcuff ourselves and we take away the ability for this council to debate with those developers. Now I know the argument has been, well, they're gonna come in and we look like the bad guys. Well, you know what, I, I mean, I think that's why I got elected, that's why I ran. And I just wanna be able to have the option to look at what I'd rather have at the gateway to the village, a beautiful residential place that brings more people downtown, or a bunch of tin storage units. And I, I think we're gonna take that ability away if we take away what we've already artfully and diligently used. And that's my argument, that's the basis for my motion, and uh, I know there's another view, and that's okay. But I, I just believe that, so. Mr. Hobbs. Uh, since there's so much contention tonight uh, about this, I, I agree with Mr. Lamb to let Ms. Luxinger in on, I'd like to have her come in and voice her views too. So the, we've done this before, we tabled it, and. You know, I don't, don't know if we have, do we have to have language tonight? A motion to table would be appropriate at this time. Or actually it would be withdrawal of your support of the motion, 
the motion, correct me if I'm wrong, would that be accurate? I'm not sure. I, I'm thinking. <clears throat> I believe in the table. I, I don't know if you can, you can table it. We have a motion to support on the floor. It's already on the floor. That's on the floor. You can put the table motion inside that motion. It's like a nested do loop thing. I don't know if it's secondary or it's, primary. You know, the motion is to schedule a second reading and adoption. No, Joe, with, with, with the changes that, that I recommend. Please That's stop. the motion so on the floor. You can change. You can adopt this one and change it. Please Next, stop. We're not, we're not going to do that, Joe. We're not going to do no, that. That's not what that. That's you right. don't need to set it aside. I move to table until Sarah Wuxinger can be present to, we can have the full council vote on such an important and dramatic issue in the village. To postpone. It's postpone. Right? I'll support table. it. Right. That's the motion. Did we have a previous motion with support or no? Your yes. motion was supported? Pardon? What are we doing with that one? Was Jerry's motion supported? Yes. We should have had a roll call on that then, right? From no, it's good well, but He no. now moved to no. table. Mr. No. Young, Mr. Young, speak into the mic, please. If you're going to have it, I'd like to have it so we can hear what we're saying here. I didn't bring my Roberts rules of order. Quick cheat sheet, but I could look it up online. Oh, okay. I guess just that's what I'm asking. If we have a motion to support and we don't take any action on that, we can make new motions in support, but do we have to take or actions? Could, or you could withdraw yours and make it simple so that they could postpone. Yeah. Is that the next motion is to postpone until a full meeting? Mr. Lamb is waiting to do that. And that's Mr. Uh, Hobbs' intent as well? Yeah, I, I support it. Yeah. Okay, I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. We have a motion on the floor to uh, postpone to the next meeting and support Mr. Young. What would you like to say? The only thing I want to point out is that, correct me if I'm wrong, tonight we were going to do first reading introduction. We're done so, with it. so on the 10th, you could adopt it. Now, we're if you're going to postpone it, you're not going to be able to adopt it. The motion right? is to postpone it, Joe. You have to wait. You know, the time, at the next meeting, the next then meeting you're going to say you're going to schedule the next meeting to adopt. You with me? Yeah, we're going to um, push it to the next meeting. So we though. need to accept for first reading. No, we don't. The motion is you, to. You have to have two readings. The motion, that's right. They can happen after first the meeting. Well, first meeting. First reading is going to take two more meetings. That's fine. That's okay. So that's okay. That's you okay. Know, okay, fine. The. Uh, I would like to offer my comments. I don't think they're appropriate, but I disagree with Mr. Narsh about tin shacks, about the projects. There's only been one. And so I disagree with a number of those statements. <clears throat> and I'll wait to have my debate about density because we did just give that. The, the uh, Planning Commission moved on August 9th from eight units to 15 units per acre. That takes care of that 20%. We've been more than generous to provide for growth here in this community. If it were to remain at 1.5, that brings it to 22.7. That would allow that lumber yard all the density it needs for it to be a good development. Had we not done that, I might look at that 20%, but I'm not interested in it anymore. And we've already given that growth by changing the per unit acre count. <clears throat> so, we've got a motion on the floor. Do we need roll call or comment? You can, you can do a voice vote. Second's been here by Mr. Hobbs. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Brad. Thank you. Councilman. The only, uh, well, it doesn't matter at this point. So we have <coughs> council comments, item number 11. Mr. Matheson. Nothing tonight, thank you. Oh, thank you. Gosh. Mr. Hobbs. Well, Merry Christmas to everybody. Have a good holiday, safe holiday. Enjoy your family and the peace that we have here in the village. Mr. Narsh. Uh, just once again, it's been my first time uh, at a meeting since uh, this unspeakable tragedy, and I just, again, voice my support. Um, Ori and Oxford's one family. They always have been. Um, 
that's been a big part of my life personally is preparing and training for something like that. And I know that our department here in Lake Orion responded and uh, uh, combined with all of the first responders up there did everything humanly possible to save and preserve life. And uh, I applaud our first responders, I applaud our medical teams uh, that did in fact help save lives. Um, and it's uh, just a, a moment in time to reflect on the value of life. We've got a wonderful community and Oxford and Orion is just really one family. And uh, I, I know I speak for all of us when I say that's, that's who we are. And um, we're looking forward to Christmas. We have a parade coming up. Um, and there's so many people that say we, we need that parade. We need a little um, joy and some relief. Um, and I believe you'll find uh, some really cool uh, reflection on both as that parade comes forward in respecting our community to the north. And uh, I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and uh, I hope they come to the parade and uh, enjoy themselves. That's Thank all. You. Ms. Rock. Yeah, I just want to say in general, I don't support um, just tabling and postponing things until everybody can be here because we're all going to miss it at some point or another. And if we always waited for everything, we wouldn't get anything done. Um, the reason I supported it tonight is because it was getting pretty heated. So I think it gives everybody a chance to regroup and um, yeah, do take some time, do some more diligence reading in, of this um, amendment. So there's that. And then wish everybody a safe and healthy Christmas. Thank you. Mr. Lamb. I'd like to wish everybody Merry Christmas. And I know there's been a lot of tragedy. Uh, I've had a lot of you know, personal loss in my family this month. It's been pretty rough on me, but I still got here to be with you guys. Um, I just want to say in reflection of the year that I'm still working on reducing the DDA district and getting a map together. Uh, Mr. Young is uh, offered to help because there doesn't seem to be any action from the DDA towards this in, in reducing the size of the DDA district to include um, areas that are not benefiting from the DDA. And so I was, as each DDA item comes up, I will discuss it openly and, and loudly to, so that everyone in the, in the public and here on council will understand the, the dynamics. The, um, uh, the one of the reasons why I'm so opposed uh, to the PUD ordinance is I believe that developers in our community are using the call for blight and um, you know screwed up properties as an excuse to, to get high um, density developments. There's a couple issues with the properties um, that I want to address. One is the, the Eman Center. I was naive in approving that project. Um, I don't regret approving it, but I was naive. Uh, the Eman Center project, you know, the, the landowners paid $50,000 for the property and they sat on it five years. And now they're selling it for, I, I believe, at the figure I was quoted is $1.2 million to the developers. And then developers are presenting it to us as a blighted property that needs tax abatements for us to fix the property. So what I'm saying is, you know, why didn't the original owners uh, apply? Okay, this doesn't make sense to me. Uh, the Lumberyard family, very nice people. Um, unfortunately, they spent the last uh, 80 years contaminating their own property and wrecking their own property and blighting the property, um, which is fine, they're entitled to do that and I respect them. Uh, my understanding is they're being paid $2.5 million for their property and then we're gonna be asked to give all our tax revenues and our public dollars to the developers to clean the property up. Okay, why don't they you know, take the $2.5 million and clean the property up themselves and then sell it to someone legitimately? So these are, these are deep personal and ethical concerns I have as an elected public official. And um, gee whiz, I'm in a community of 2,872 people and nobody else really seems to care that much. So as we go into the next year, that's what I'll be thinking about. So thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, quick comments. Uh, 
the our insurance coverage, I just want to mention this because I thought about it during the insurance coverage tonight, that I'd like to review our incentive program to opt out. Currently we have 15 employees, 13 participate. I know there's an opt out provision that we provide where we pay them a certain amount of money if they have insurance possibilities from another source. So I'd just like to review that, I'm just saying, because I think there's some opportunities there to help reduce our insurance and make it beneficial to the insured employees. Uh, Parks and Rec survey and lakeorian.org underneath the news tab. We're asking that everybody fill that out and get that in by January 17th, so time is ticking. Looking for a January 24th discussion about that master plan. So looking for that to get fulfilled. There's also one out there available from the township about the township parks that we all should participate in as well. I did want to just mention, uh, much like um, Mr. Narsh had, that Orion and Oxford, for as long as I've known, I've been here 32 years now, have been dear, dear, dear brothers and sisters and we've shared many things and we're continuing to share today and Orion Oxford Strong. That's it for me Mr. Young. Yes, I just um, had a couple of things to remind people we are DPW uh, leaves can be bagged and taken to the cemetery. DPW is going back out with the leaf blower also uh, we just got the truck fixed and new tires on it, so they will be out with this good weather this week, so hopefully we'll get as much cleared out to make the road safer for this winter. And the um, uh, KMI um, maintenance, road maintenance started their manhole replacements this week. Uh, today I heard a compliment on how nice it looks. I haven't been out there to see it myself yet, but... And uh, we did... Um, Looking to hire two seasonal people, one starting next week and one the following week to fill in for our void when we've had a person out for six weeks and our seasonal has been out and people going on vacation. Um, so we're looking to be able to get back caught up or less behind on a number of uh, maintenance issues we have um, and the prospect of seeing if one of those could be for consideration for a permanent position and subject to the budget coming up. So other than that, I'm, I'm happy about the audit. That's always a big thing for me. Being a finance person, I'm, I'm glad we improved significantly uh, financially and organizationally with the council allowing uh, to hire a full-time treasurer and a full-time staff person. That makes a big difference, and they'll see more improvements and changes as, uh, as we move along. So I'm just to let you know I uh, much, very much appreciate that. And uh, look forward to uh, the upcoming year and wish everybody a uh, safe and peaceful holiday season. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed means adjourn. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Thank you. <laughs>